Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have a death ray. Archimedes, if that's how you say it, was born in 287 BC in the city state of Syracuse, which at the time was a part of ancient Greece, but now would be a part of Sicily. When the Roman army set sail to lay siege on Syracuse, he began trying to find ways to deal with protecting his home and ways to bring death to those in the Roman army. He used his knowledge of physics to build a weapon that would help fend off those sailing into the city. While he managed to make quite a few effective and honestly very cool gadgets in order to fight these men off, the one we are here to talk about today is the death ray. While this sounds like some sort of crazy laser beam, it is surprisingly much simpler despite us not being able to recreate it today. The death ray was a series of mirrors that reflected concentrated sunlight onto the Roman ships. If you've ever used a magnifying glass in sunlight, you know where this is going. Those concentrated rays of sunlight were enough to set the ships ablaze, and it is said that ship after ship of the Roman fleet all caught fire, only to then sink into the Mediterranean. Many attempts to recreate the death ray have of course happened, and some have been moderately successful, but not in the way that this historical story suggests. Maybe he just had that magic touch. In our number 9 spot today we have Ulfbert. This mysterious sword has been confusing ever since it was discovered by archaeologists. Experts were able to date this sword back to the Viking era sometime from 800 to 1000 AD, but no one could figure out how this sword was made, especially from what technologies were available at the time. It seemed as though this sword was made using techniques that didn't exist until 800 years later when the industrial revolution happened, so how could it have been made all this time before? It is said that everything about the sword, from the composition of the metal to the extreme heat needed to forge the blade, it just couldn't have been done at the time, but clearly it was. So how? A blacksmith who tried to recreate the sword using only methods that would have been used then explained that he was unable to make it without resorting to more modern technology. In our number 8 spot today we have Nepenthe. If you're a person who's ever had to be subjected to the process that is antidepressant medication, this one might frustrate you just a little bit. The ancient Greeks and Romans discovered a lot of things, some of which we use now and some that seem to have been lost but could have potentially proved to be accepted exceptionally useful to us, and that is exactly what this one is. Ancient Greeks were known to treat the bereaved with this medicine that seems to have been some sort of a primitive antidepressant. It is said that it was known for its ability to chase sorrow away and also to cause forgetfulness. There are many references to this medicinal plant, but at this point we are completely unsure of which modern plant aligns with these ancient descriptions, or if it even exists at all anymore. In our number 7 spot today we have the Telharmonium. The Telharmonium is regarded as one of the world's first electronic instruments. This the instrument was kind of like an organ, but it used wheels to create different synthetic tones. From here, the tones would be transmitted over telephone wires with the intention of getting the music broadcast so that people could listen in. Considering the fact that this instrument was created in 1897, that's a pretty cool invention for the time, so the fact that it once existed is super cool. Unfortunately, however, the idea was taking too much energy from the grid, which led to it being totally scrapped. Instead of finding out another way to use this instrument, or just waiting for technology to advance to a point where this would be able to be used, they just destroyed it. Now, in 2021, not only does the Telharmonium not exist, but there aren't even any recordings of it, so it seems as though this might be one thing that's lost forever. In our number 6 spot today we have the Library of Alexandria. This isn't necessarily technology as we now think of the word, but this certainly was one of the greatest losses we've seen. This library is said to have held a collection of over 1 million scrolls, which are said to have been all of the written works in the world at the time. The library was founded in 300 BC, and it was where the scholars of the time would come to study. It is said that when a person visited the library, they needed to give over any books that they had so that they could be copied and added to the collection of the library. It isn't exactly clear what it was that destroyed it, but rumors range from Julius Caesar accidentally setting it on fire to an invasion that set it ablaze. At the end of the day, the building burned and everything in it was destroyed. What was in that building was absolutely priceless, and we can only guess at what secrets it held. Unfortunately, many of what was in that library wasn't written anywhere else, so it's destined to stay a mystery. In our number 5 spot today we have Cloudbuster. In the 1950s, a man named William Reich created a pseudoscientific thing that was called a Cloudbuster. 
It is said that this device could manipulate a certain energy that would affect the atmosphere, which would then change the patterns of the weather. The energy that the device is said to manipulate is called Oregon energy. It is said that they actually used this device on a farm in the 1950s, and it actually worked when it ended up calling down rain. Apparently, people have tried to make modern cloud busters, but to severe consequences for both the person who made it as well as the area surrounding their invention. Many people are wondering now if this cloud buster ever actually worked, and if it did, how? Because we just can't seem to make anything like it. If you had a working cloud buster, what would you do with it? Do you make a snowstorm? A perfectly rainy day? I don't know. Let me know down below in the comments what you would do. In our number four spot today, we have Starlight. Starlight was created in the 1970s and 80s by a British hairstylist and amateur chemist, Maurice Ward. What Starlight was, was a heat resistant plastic that was basically indestructible. This plastic could withstand temperatures of 10,000 degrees Celsius, and it could withstand a force 75 times that of Hiroshima. Of course, when people heard about this invention, it became the talk of the town. When Maurice brought the material on TV, he covered an egg in Starlight, blasted it with a blowtorch for five minutes, and then when the starlight was peeled back, the egg was still cold. NASA of course wanted to know what the heck starlight was and how they could get their hands on it, but Maurice was really worried about what would happen if his invention fell into the wrong hands. This led to him keeping the makeup of starlight a complete secret that he took with him to his grave. It has been said that the company Thermashield has been able to replicate starlight when they received the rights in 2013, so maybe this one will be making a comeback after all. In our number three spot today, we have the Apollo Gemini space program technology. This isn't necessarily technology that has been entirely lost, but it has been the source of many, many confused scientists. The race to get to space was a fast, cutthroat one with everyone trying to be the first. With everyone running around trying to create all of these new technologies before anyone else, and with private contractors being brought on for certain things in order to help, all of the schematics and original components are so disorganized and scattered that now NASA staff are trying to like reverse engineer the entire thing to see how it all worked together in tandem. Not to mention how those private contractors of course took all of their records with them, leaving no records behind for anyone to be able to get a full view of how this was all able to take place. I guess no matter the rush, it's equally as important to keep the documentation. You would think that NASA would have had someone just to keep documents, right? I feel like there's got to be someone out there who's got that job now. And our number two spot today, we have the Wardenclyffe Tower. This tower was also known as the Tesla Tower, so I'm sure you can guess who built it. This tower was an early experimental wireless transmission station that was designed by Nikola Tesla. It was located in Long Island in 1901 and 1902. So here's the thing. The industrialist, JP Morgan, was the one who asked Tesla to create this wireless tower that could send messages across the world. Okay, sweet. That's super useful to us, so that would be great, right? Well, what Tesla built was even better. It was a device that would transmit free electricity across the world. What? Free electricity? That's amazing. Well, when Mr. Morgan found out, he shut the project down, had the tower destroyed, and ruined it for everyone. Imagine we all had free energy right now. I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little irritated now that I know this. Tesla's ability to wirelessly power light bulbs and other devices short distances is something that we still cannot replicate or implement in an economic way today. In our number one spot today, we have the Tesla oscillator. Have you ever wanted to live through an earthquake on purpose? No? Me neither. And good thing we don't because this little old gadget doesn't exist anymore. Apparently Nikola Tesla did though when he built the Tesla oscillator also known as the earthquake machine. This oscillator resonated at such a frequency, it shook the buildings around him. While this wasn't the intended use, this is what ended up happening. It is said that he couldn't get it to shut down, so then he had to take a sledgehammer to it to destroy it and stop the shaking. Since this destruction and accidental earthquake, no one has ever been able to replicate the same sort of thing, and that's probably a good thing to be perfectly honest. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Greek fire. Greek fire is essentially the primitive form of napalm and it was first created in Greece. It was used often and efficiently for naval battles during the Byzantine Empire. It was used and worked well for these battles because it was able to not only float on top of the water, but it also was difficult to put out the fire using water as well. The secrets regarding this substance were guarded so greatly as it was such a powerful weapon at the time 
The information on what it was made out of, how it was stored, or how it functioned remains a mystery to this day. The formula to recreate it has been tried many times, but it is currently thought that the particular storage and some sort of pressurized delivery system are what played such a huge role in its functionality and ignition, and we have yet to figure out those secrets. In our number 9 spot today, we have flexible glass. This is something that is actually sometimes debated on whether or not it actually existed at all, but there is some evidence and anecdotes that would suggest it absolutely did at one point. The story surrounding this lost creation depict a glassmaker who presents a glass vessel which holds various different things depending on where the story came from and who's telling it. The glass vessel was presented to the emperor who inspected it before returning it to the glassmaker who then threw it on the ground. The glassmaker then picks it up off of the ground and goes on to show the emperor that rather than broken pieces, the glass vessel just has a small dent in it, which he then proceeds to hammer back to the original shape, and thus the vessel now appears as if it had never taken any damage at all. It is said from here that rather than the emperor being excited about this new and useful creation, he began to worry that it would devalue things like the silver and gold already in circulation. This is said to have led to him ensuring that no one else knew the formula to create the flexible glass, and then subsequently beheading the poor glassmaker. This is what has ensured that if it ever were real, the flexible glass was a secret formula destined to stay in the past. In our number 8 spot today we have Damascus Steel. It's possible you may have heard of Damascus Steel before, and that is because the name still exists, and it is used in reference to a variety of pattern welded forged steel products, but the modern day stuff just isn't what it used to be. Historically, Damascus Steel was discovered quite a long time ago, and it was used to make swords in the Middle East. It is said that these swords had the ability to cut through rocks or even completely cut through other swords, which is just insane. The exact process of how these swords were made has been lost to time, but it is rumored that Wootz steel was imported from Sri Lanka and used in the creation process along with other metals. Somehow the metals were basically weaved together rather than an alloy being created. This is what led to the steel not only being exceptionally strong, but also flexible, and it is this process that modern day smiths cannot seem to exactly replicate. The modern day Damascus products are definitely high quality, gorgeous products, but it seems as though the secrets of the past may hold something even better. In our number 7 spot today we have Silphium. This is less of a technology and more of something that was once naturally occurring and used for a multitude of things, but is now lost. Silphium is a lost genus of fennel plant that was used quite a bit during the Roman times. It was used as a form of birth control as well as a cure for many ailments. The plant is said to have been plentiful once along the coast of what is now Libya. Apparently this plant was something that was highly valued and it even appeared on several forms of currency because it was so highly appreciated. It is speculated that this plant may have grown only in a small portion of the world and it was simply just over harvested until it was driven to extinction. It wasn't used by everyone when it was used and this could be because it was probably quite expensive. So while this wasn't a man made creation or technology, I feel like it definitely still applies to today's list as a plant and its medical properties are something that just may be lost forever. In our number 6 spot today we have the pyramids. Alright, I'm just gonna ask, how the heck were the pyramids built? The more I learn about it, the more I'm convinced it must have been aliens because it just seems so crazy and intricate and impossibly amazing. The pyramids of ancient Egypt may just appear to be amazing incredible tombs that are something to be jealous of, but they really are so much more than that. Not only have they given researchers and historians incredible insight to what life in ancient Egypt was like, they have also opened the doors to some of the greatest mysteries. Firstly, there was the transportation of the massive stones that they used, some of which are believed to have come from nearly 500 miles away. Getting all of the materials from point A to point B is more than fascinating in itself, but there's more questions. There were not iron tools or chisels at the time, so how were they able to shape their stonework with such incredible precision? How were they able to finish the tops of the pyramids with the same precision despite their standing over 400 feet tall? And how were they able to build them in such a way that they've been able to withstand all of the elements for 4,500 years. You see what I mean at this point? It is clear that however they were able to build the pyramids in ancient Egypt, we just don't have that kind of technology or knowledge nowadays because there is no way we'd be able to recreate these amazing structures in 
the same way as the original. Because people are gonna be like, we could create the pyramids. I'm like, I know we could now, Mr. Crane Operator. But imagine having to go up there all by yourself. No crane in sight. Just you and a big old rock. Good luck. <laughs> in our number five spot today, we have the Sloot Coding System. Okay, this one isn't exactly ancient, but I still had to talk about it today because I had never even heard of this at all before. Jan Sloot was a Dutch electronics engineer, and in the mid to late 90s, he created a data storage method that could hold an entire full length movie in just eight kilobytes of data. Considering most modern technologies still require much more data to store a full length movie, this kind of technology was extremely impressive for the times. Investors, of course, quickly began to flock to Jan. When he presented his data storage system to a man named Roll Piper from Philips, Roll ended up later leaving Philips in order to join Jan's company. Just days before the code and system was due to be released, Jan ended up being found dead in his garden from what seemed to be a heart attack. This is, of course, extremely tragic and sad, but you might be sitting there thinking, the same thing that I was. His death probably didn't stop people from still seeking the answers that had yet to be released on how this storage system was created. Well, as it turns out, people of course did look, but a key piece of information regarding it all was on a floppy disk that was in Jan's possession. Since his death, no one has ever been able to find this floppy disk that is said to hold these secrets. In our number four spot today, we have the Antikythera Mechanism. The Antikythera Mechanism is an extremely mysterious discovery that has stumped researchers ever since it was found. This artifact was found 150 feet below the surface of the Aegean Sea in a shipwreck and is the oldest kind of computer ever recorded as it was dated back to the 7th century BCE. The author David Childress likened the finding to if they had found a jet plane in King Tut's tomb. That's how bizarre this discovery really was. Due to the complexity and oddity of the finding, alien enthusiasts have believed for quite some time that it may have been technology that was passed down from some sort of superior being. This first analog computer may have had a ton of uses, and researchers aren't 100% sure about all the ways it was used, but it is known to have been some sort of astronomical calculator. It was able to predict eclipses and different planetary placements. The mechanism was able to calculate the position and running time of each planet. How would they have been able to create this without the use of sophisticated astronomical tools? We have been able to recreate the mechanism to see how it functions, but no one is able to tell how it could have possibly been created. In our number three spot today, we have Mithridate. Mithridate was named after King Mithridate the sixth, who was the king of Pontus. It is said that he was so terribly afraid of being poisoned that he, over the course of seven years, adapted his body to different poisons. It is also said that after mixing 45 Five ingredients together, he was able to create Mithridate, which is said to have been a universal antidote to all poisons. The exact formula has of course been lost to time, but historians have said that it is believed that the antidote contained opium, chopped vipers, and small amounts of both the poisons and their antidotes. Imagine, just opium, just throw it in there, why not? The antidote was originally created around 100 BCE, and it was actually used by many people for centuries, and even a apparently as recently as the 19th century. It is unclear how the recipe entirely disappeared, but despite some of the best efforts, no one has been able to recreate it since the last known use. In our number two spot today, we have Stradivari violins. If you're a string instrument enthusiast, then you definitely have heard of the Stradivari family and the instruments created by them. These instruments were created by 1650 and 1750 and were highly sought after in their day, and even more so now. Apparently, these instruments featured an unparalleled sound quality that has been found to be impossible to recreate. The instruments that have survived through to modern day are now worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, so it is abundantly clear that these instruments are incredibly valuable. Here's the catch though. Experts can't agree or figure out what exactly it is that makes them sound so wonderful. Some have speculated that the magnificent sound comes from a fungus that grew in the region, and some think that it is the density of the wood, but regardless, no one really knows for sure. 
At the end of the day, the secrets of the family art were laid to rest with the Stradivari family. In our number one spot today, we have Roman cement. Concrete is the most commonly used building material in the world, but our current cement, water, sand, rocks mixture is nothing compared to the original stuff. While our modern concrete was created in the 1700s, there was obviously stuff that was being used before. In fact, concrete was used quite a bit during the antiquity by Egyptians, Assyrians, and Romans. The Romans seemingly used it the most, and they are the ones who really perfected the recipe that we just can't seem to replicate now. Apparently, the ancient mixture in involved burnt limestone as well as crushed rocks and water, but whatever the heck it was, their structures were a lot more withstanding than ours are now, which has led people to question, how do we get that level of hardiness back in our modern day concrete? And to that I say, like most other things, I do not know. Perhaps this is just another mystery lost to time. Coming in number 10, we have flexible glass. I mean, think of what we could do with a substance like that. You could make windows that never break. You could make a cup that never breaks. You make a bunch of other things that could never break. Basically, it would be an extremely durable version of everyday glass, and you could bet that would be a hot selling item. The first record of flexible glass happened between the years 14 and 37 AD. There was the great emperor Tiberius who would take exotic goods from all over the land. There was a glass maker who came to him with something very unique. It was a beautiful vase. He handed it to the emperor who dropped it by accident, but the vase didn't break. It dented. The glass maker quickly repaired it in front of the emperor as a way to impress him, but it didn't work like that. The emperor saw this as a threat, for his empire had a ton of wealth in precious metals to make various items. This flexible glass could have hurt business, so to hide the secret of this glass maker, he had him taken to the dungeon and killed. Not how this dude probably thought this was going to play out. And if you comb through history, there were a couple more times where this mysterious material pops up, but it never has made made its way to this day and age. Who knows? Maybe someone will make this material and be able to keep their head on their shoulders. And guys, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe. It really helps us out. Coming in number nine, we have the Hufanj Di Dong Yi. How do you know when an earthquake has happened? Well, you need a bunch of high-tech gear to tell you when it hit and how powerful it was. Well, that is actually dead wrong. There was a device in ancient China that was made by Zhang Hong. He was an incredible genius for his time and created a seismograph that was incredibly accurate. This thing was basically a big pot that would move with the shifting earth. There was a pendulum inside it that could point you in the direction of where an earthquake had just hit. And this device had an incredible range and could reach up to a hundred miles away. The benefit of this was an emperor could find out what villages needed help because they were just hit by a natural disaster well before they sent an envoy to come receive help. How could you make something like that with just some pot and levers? I mean, if I was alive back then, I probably would have thought earthquakes happened because you didn't give enough grain to the river god. Coming in at number eight, we have a heat ray. I mean, we have all wanted ray guns since we were kids. When will we finally get some cool futuristic weapons that can blow our minds? Well, you might want to look into the past to find something like that. The ancient Greeks had a way to blast heat at enemy ships and set them ablaze. They would have massive bronze plates that would redirect the sun's rays back at enemy ships that were approaching through the water. This would focus it like a magnifying glass and burn these ships like a weird kid who's killing ants. So the ancient Greeks had a heat ray before we had a heat ray now? That is really starting to bother me right now. Coming in number seven, we have the pyramids. I mean, this one was a given. You can't make a list of amazing ancient relics without throwing the pyramids on that list because we still don't know what happened. How did they build these big ass triangles? They are over 4,000 years old. They are 147 meters high. They have a ton of rooms and secret chambers and booby traps and detailed markings all over the walls. The Egyptians didn't have access to modern metals or even wheels. There's an estimated 2 million stones in a single pyramid. The stones weigh somewhere between one and a half and three tons. How on earth did they do it? Some people say aliens, which I don't believe. I mean, it could have been some space dudes, but I would hope that they would give us something a little bit better than rock towers. I mean, give us a ray gun or something, that's what I want. But some people think that the Egyptians could have had access to some sort of tech that was far advanced for their time, but they either destroyed it because they didn't want anyone else to use it, or the tech was simply lost to time. Coming in at number six, we have the Unartok disc. Have you
Have you ever tried to use a GPS other than Google Maps or Waze? They will take you all over the place and have you parked in some field that's six miles away from your destination. Maybe not that bad, but the Vikings had a device that put some of these apps to shame. The Unartok disc was a sundial type compass that could be used to navigate through the seas with an accuracy that was as good as a modern day compass. This explains how the Vikings were able to travel such great distances and always make it back to their homeland. But when you're making these long trips, eventually the sun will go down and then everyone is going to be praying that you don't get thrown off course while the sun isn't up. But the Vikings found a way to get this bad boy to work even when there was no light. How do you get a sundial to work in the dark? Well, you have magic crystals. That's how the ancient texts describe them. Did these Vikings have help from the gods? Well, probably not. What these crystals could most likely do was project light onto this compass when there was only a very small light source. So with the moon and the stars, you would be able to navigate in Jordan seas. Coming in at number five, we have the boomerang. All right, guys, now it's time to head down under for one of the oldest, most advanced hunting tools that we have ever seen. Sure, we have things that can kill things more effectively now than a boomerang does, but we have to appreciate how precise and deadly these things were and how you can find some ancient relics of boomerangs that seem to be better built than the ones we have today. And in case you didn't know, boomerangs are basically a wing. Someone invented something that could fly around 2300 hundred years ago. Well, that is the oldest boomerang ever found, so the first one could have been even older than that. Before people had shoes, someone made something that could not only fly and kill something, but it would also return to them. I don't know who that guy was, but whoever he was, he was an absolute legend. That guy for sure chucked that thing for the first time, and the whole tribe was like, dude, you are going to be king forever because that is the coolest thing that I have ever seen in my life. I literally don't know how the sun works, and you just made a flying stick that comes back to like a dog fetching a ball. This is amazing. Coming in at number four, we have Greek fire. This is one of the biggest mysteries of ancient Greek warfare. See, the Greeks had a weapon like none other. It was fired out of a long metallic tube that was attached to boats. It was some sort of napalm-like substance that they would fire out of these tubes and it would lace enemy ships in a flaming substance that couldn't be put out by simply pouring water on it. It must have looked like a dragon breathing fire on you. The secret as to how they were able to make such a weapon never leaked out into the wrong hands. So to this day, we still have no idea how they were able to do it. Maybe some future dudes came back in time and was like, hey, you guys wanna see something that's really gonna blow your mind? Well, let me show you this wild thing right here real quick. If you were an enemy getting blasted by this stuff, you would have for sure thought it was magic. Coming in at number three, we have ancient Chinese wells. You know how we're burning through a ton of fossil fuels right now? And after saying that, I literally understand why they call them fossil fuels, because it's fuel that comes from fossils? God. I I am dumb sometimes. Well, we all know that there are much cleaner forms of energy that we should probably be using because the world seems like it's gonna die if we don't change up our tactics. Well, in ancient China, they had tapped into wells that were full of natural gas. They dug wells deep into the ground and this was originally so they could harvest salt inland because it was very hard to get salt without going down to the ocean unless you dug these massive wells. But with this, they found shots of methane. They then built bamboo tubes that led to people's homes so they could use the natural gas to heat their houses. That's pretty cool if you ask me, but now that I'm thinking about it, methane isn't the cleanest energy, but it's still amazing tech to have a natural gas chute that goes directly to your home. Coming in number two, we have the Ulfberth sword. There was a tomb found in Scandinavia that had some amazing swords in it. There were over a hundred swords discovered, and there was something that set these bladed weapons apart from all the others from the era. They were much more advanced than any other swords that were made from nations around that time. These blades were made out of 99.9% .9 pure metal. I mean, if you were to look into most metal objects today, I'm sure they would be skimping somewhere. The metal pieces in your car probably have little bits of plastic in them to help cut cost. What was so impressive about these weapons is that the surrounding areas would not get this kind of technology until 800 years later. Between the compass that you could use in the dark when you were out on the ocean and the swords that were 800 years ahead of their time, it's no wonder that the Vikings were able to be such a force of destruction. And coming at the number one spot, we have Mithridatium. That sounds like something that would be pulled out of a Tolkien book, but it's actually one of the most mysterious substances made by King Mithridates IV of Pontius. This guy was living during Emperor Nero's reign around 60 BC. The king had developed a substance called Mithridatium, which was apparently an antidote to all poisons. Sounds like a pretty handy tool, especially if you're a king or emperor. We all know that people are trying to poison them at all all 
multiple hours of the day. Now, the recipe for this substance was never let out to the public. Only the king and Emperor Nero himself knew how to make it, and maybe they should have told a few more people because eventually the formula was lost, and since then, no one has been able to recreate this elixir. But maybe it was all a lie. Nero could have spread rumors that he had such a tool so people wouldn't be so bold to poison him. I mean, that would be a pretty smart move.